From inside John Hurt's chest, it's the IGN DigiGuys. Put your hands together for two face huggers, Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. All right, Mark. In the in the uh, the roulette game of Butler, are you putting your money on Warner Brothers or uh, Harvey? Well, we should probably give some context to that because I don't know if everybody knows the story. And I got to tell you, it's an interesting story. You know, there's, <laughs> there's so much like inside baseball negotiations and whatnot that go on with these movies. And this one, which Wade will explain, is an interesting little fight between Harvey Weinstein, who was always the heavyweight champ in all these uh, scenarios, and well, Warner Brothers. It, it, it always, it, you know, everything always boils down to Harvey using a dispute with the MPAA or a dispute with the MPAA rules to generate, uh, you know, publicity for a movie. And it's unbelievable because every time he gets an NC-17 where he wanted an R or an R where he wanted a PG, all he does is just make a stink and stamp his feet and throw a tantrum. And then he eventually gets his way and the tantrum wound up being free publicity and the movie winds up making money, which is all he wanted in the first place. I mean, Bully being the most recent example, but now this is The Butler, which is uh, the new Lee Daniels film, Lee Daniels, who did Precious, which is based on uh, a true story of a guy who was a butler in the White House who, you know, he was a sharecropper's son and he, he, you know, came from the cotton fields and never had a formal education and wound up, you know, working his way up becoming a butler in the White House. And he served every president from um, uh, uh, Eisenhower all the way through uh, Reagan. And, uh, you know, then was invited back when Obama became president. And, you know, the whole thing of seeing a black man elected president and just kind of vindicated his whole life. And, you know, it's, it's, it, the, the concept behind it is very moving. We'll, we'll see how the movie is. Um, but, uh, you know, Forrest Whitaker plays the lead. And they've been promoting this thing for months as the butler. And then all of a sudden uh, Warner Brothers says, no, under MPAA, because you're a signatory to the MPAA and so are we. There's uh, there are MPAA rules that say that you ha- if you want to use a title for your movie that is owned by an- that belongs to another movie that is owned by another MPAA member, we have to go to an arbitration or you have to ask permission. And we have a 1916 silent comedy short uh, that is also called The Butler, and we don't want you to use the title. And they went to MPAA arbitration, which ruled for Warner Brothers, and they went neener neener. And then uh, Harvey went and hired David Boyce. Of uh, you know, 2000 uh, Florida the, election the, uh, the fame Gore, and it, Bush, yeah. of the Gore Bush fame and the and also of uh, Boyce was on the Gore side, right? Wasn't he? Wasn't he? Uh... He was on. He was on the the Gore side. He was on the Gore side. Yeah, yes. and, and he was on the Gore side. And then uh, he also was on Prop Eight with his former opponent from uh, the, uh, the 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 Bush Gore fight. Right? They like joined forces. That's right. right. And uh, the guy who lost his wife in 9/11. What's his name? I always forget his name. Anyway, uh, never so you... mind. It's not important. So uh, the so anyway, uh, they hired David Boyce to send, you know, to file a restraining order and to do all his mean stuff. And we're not going to abide by the fines. And then the Warner Brothers attorneys are firing back these nasty letters. I'm I'm sorry. I just keep thinking it's like maybe Warner Brothers is technically correct by the rules, but just by doing this and saying we're trying to protect the title to a 1916 silent short that we've never even seen fit to put out on DVD or even stream and we we may not even know where the hell the negative is and it might not even exist anymore that's just it's just lame dude it just it just makes you look petty it really does and you know and and Harvey's been smart in using the whole making Warner Brothers look Horrible because this is a civil rights story yeah. about African Americans. Oh, and, and Lee Daniels sent a personal letter, which yes. of course he made public to Kevin Sujihara, the new CEO of uh, the new studio head over at Warner Brothers. And Sujihara apparently wrote a private letter back. Um, so who knows what the content of that was? But that was sent the same day that the Warner lawyers, you know, uh, started start spouting off. But it, Warner Brothers just doesn't look good here. And uh, allegedly, it, there's something else going on behind the scenes, which is that Warner Brothers wanted uh, the rights to some Weinstein movie to remake, and Harvey didn't play ball, and they're they're pissed off about it. But it still Warner Brothers just looks lame. It just goes. It's like it's like going back to the Groucho thing, you know, the uh, Night in Night Casablanca. Casablanca. Yeah, yeah it's, which was again Warner Brothers saying, you know, we don't want you to use the name Casablanca. Blanca, and he sent that really, but, but really the, unbelievably <laughs> funny letter. But the difference is, is that Groucho Marx can send a letter yeah. to Warner Brothers attorneys that yes. is just gut bustingly funny, <laughs> and then Warner Brothers would send back a letter to Groucho saying, um, "Can you please explain the plot of your film because we didn't quite get it from your letter." <laughs> yeah. And then, and then Groucho sends another letter that's even like more cryptic, you know. And then, and, and, and then they just release the movie anyway. Yeah. Well, it but went, now it, you get Lee Daniels, who's yeah. like obviously that's yeah. there's no there's no more humor left in these sorts of situations. 
So Lee Daniels' letter, if you read it, is very uh, heartfelt and the movie means yeah. a lot to him and it's a civil rights story. So, uh, yeah, you know what? Well, That's the thing. It's like these things are these things make big, huge Hollywood, you know, mucky mucks look very petty. Well, it, it, it will be resolved. I mean, there's going to be an agreement. But... Although, you know what? The, the, oh, supposedly, uh, this is funny, the Warner Brothers did sign off on Lee Daniels' The Butler. They just did not sign off on The Butler. You're not going to release it as Lee Daniels, no. the butler. Who is this, John just, Carpenter? Johnny <laughs> Carpenter's the thing. John Carpenter's the butler. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I mean, they'll come to an agreement, but the result of all of this dust up and during the interim will be to do only two things. Um, it'll give the butler a lot of free publicity, like we're giving it right now, and uh, it'll make Warner Brothers look petty. I mean, I don't see how that's ever a positive for Warner Brothers. So, I mean, Harvey is already winning this. It's just, and, and let's say Warner Brothers does prevail and they preserve the title for the butler. Well, goody bully for you. That, that 1916 silent comedy short is really going to rake it in, isn't it? I mean, are you, are you going to remake it? Are you going to remake it because it's got uh, pre-awareness, that title? Because people are, oh, I've been waiting for them to do that. I heard that was really good. It, like, stars people I've never heard of. I don't even know what it's about. No one knows. It's, it's about a, a butler. No, whatever. It's high school. You know, it's, it's, these guys are duke, you know, like, like it's high school. Whatever. Speaking of pre-awareness, and uh, everybody apparently really liked the interview that I did with Stefan Hammond last week. Gave you the week off. Did you have a good Independence Day? I did have a good Independence Day. I saw fireworks, and I had a nice meal with my mother. Good deal. Um, Well, yeah, you know, talk to Stefan Hammond, who I haven't seen since uh, the month of the handover of Hong Kong. So I'm in Hong Kong in 1997. And uh, he came here. He's he's looking to uh, do start doing more books and stuff again. So uh, we talked about Hong Kong film, and it was a it was a great interview, and a lot of people seem to really like it. And on that account, um, on the Facebook page, I have certainly been saying a lot of amazing things about the new Linda Obst book, uh, Sleepless in Hollywood. Mm. And Mark's getting up to go get his copy of it. It looks like yes, he is. He's he's running to go get his copy. Um, you know, Linda Obst, the uh, the producer of countless great movies, mostly romantic comedies, things like How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days and Sleepless in Seattle, and I just uh, slammed it on the table. And uh, Contact, and what else has Linda Obst done? I mean, lots of. Well, amazing let me read movies. the back of her book. Uh, Linda Obst directed, uh, directed, uh, produced The Fisher King. There you go. The Fisher Adventures King. in Babysitting, Hope Floats, Sleepless right. in Seattle. This is my life, whatever that is. Um, this is and, my life uh, was the Nora Ephron thing. And Star Wars. With what? Julie, Julie Kavner. Oh. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Linda Obst, uh, an amazing producer, had previously written the book uh, Hello, He Lied, which was all about her initial adventures in Hollywood. This is about the new Hollywood. And Linda Obst used to be an editor at the New York Times Magazine. And she um, kind of put her journalist hat back on for this book uh, because she wanted to figure out why is suddenly do produ- is it so hard to be a producer when you were always a successful producer not just for her but for so many others why has the business just suddenly become all about superheroes and sequels and why is it so hard to get anything done and you know why is it, it the sky is falling and so she went and she talked to all of the people that only she has access to right she went to Jim Giannopoulos and she went to agents and marketing people and uh, you know uh, Peter Chernin and, and to, to really to kind of figure this out it's a, it's a little bit of a of a, of a detective story and it includes a lot of her own experiences at Paramount which is the middle chapter of the book have you read it yet have you I am on page uh, 110 okay so you're you're not yet into the Paramount stuff Actually, the Paramount stuff. Actually, that's the that's the uh, chapter I'm on from there Paramount to Paranoia. That that is an unbelievably riveting chapter. Anyway, um, the uh, it's, it, this is a great book, and I think it's the most. I would say it's the most important uh, book written about the movie business and where it's going since William Goldman's Adventures in Screen Trade. Well, you know what's funny? My uh, my aunt was in town over the weekend, and we were talking about uh, movies. And you know, my aunt is. You know, 70 and lives in New York and yeah. isn't, uh, you know, she loves movies, but she's not a super consumer of the business. And we were talking about movies and she's, and we were talking about Man of Steel and she says, yeah, because nowadays, you know, they just make movies for teenage boys. Like, yep. Hang on for a second. Mm-hmm. That's actually, that's true, but that's almost five to ten year old thinking because what they're really doing is they're making movies for China. Yes. And that's the crux of yeah. Linda's book. And it is it is an amazing book. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Aren't you loving it? We, you know what? It's here's the thing. It's she says nothing that I think we haven't already thought of, but she says in an entertaining she puts way, it together with inside access that's enjoyable to read. Absolutely, it's stuff that we say every week on the podcast, that I say every week on NPR, that we all talk about with each other after every bad screening, and we all rant about it. But she somehow brings it all together and puts it up 
you know, on a canvas with a frame and it makes it understandable. And it, it's just, it's, it's brilliant. I think it's an incredible book, Sleepless in Hollywood. And I'm so, I was so enamored of the book that I, I actually chased her down, believe it or not. Really? Yes, I did. You didn't tell me that. I chased Linda Obes down and I talked to her uh, last week for an hour on the phone. What? And I recorded it. And it's going to be a midweek. See, I didn't tell you about no, this. No, you didn't. I don't this know is, this. This is going to be a midweek update to the podcast. We're really? Gonna, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have IGN throw this up uh, middle of the week. Um, and or you know a few days after this episode goes up. What the up. hell? I would have wanted. I, 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 <laughs> well, I would have been interested in interviewing her too. Well, you were you were taking your week off. This yeah. was uh, this was your your off week. You um, mean so? I had no knowledge of that. I know. Did you I, booking guests behind my back well, and interviewing them and putting them on the? Well, I was doing podcast. I was doing all this stuff during the during, during the well, off so week. So what did you do? So you you email you talk to her agent or email well, the, the, the pub- publisher? Or whatever? The, the publicist for the publisher. I got hold of them and I just said I I I I, I would love to talk to her. I'd love to you know be able to set up something up at a cafe or something. Turns out she's in New York. She's on her book tour, so uh, it had to be a phoner. But we we just got to talking and. Uh, it, it was it uh, illuminating on a level I can't even I can't I mean it it you know crystallized all the stuff from the book and I obviously brought up a lot of things that aren't in the book and she was wonderful she's just great so uh, I'm gonna throw that up middle of the week and uh, I don't want to have to go I don't want to have to go to IGN to listen to our podcast fine I'll send you the file thank you I'll send you the file separately you thank can you. you can listen to it. now it she it was it was uh, she's just great and I'm so. You know, so glad that she's out there doing this and fighting the good fight. And the thing about the book is, don't you agree? She's kind of like a prophet of doom, but also a prophet of like salvation at the same time. Like she's telling us how bad things are and how bad it's going to get, but there's still light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I'm just not sure. You know, through this book, and since I didn't get to interview Linda, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm just not sure who's going to be shamed. By reading this, is any studio will any studio head be shamed? Oh yeah, into making into well do, it's shamed into doing something differently. No, but does anybody come? Like is Disney going to be shamed into making anything it, other than Pixar? And, well, uh, not Lucas shamed, and, but I think what she talks about eventually is that the economics that there are that they are relying on cannot. It, it's an unsustainable dream. Well, it's, it's kind of like what uh, what Spielberg and Lucas said a couple yeah, of weeks ago. Exactly, exactly. And and also, I if you want to talk about people who don't come off smelling very good in the book, I mean, you're in the chapter right now. There, there's a certain studio head right now of a certain studio. Oh, is Brad Gray? Who who really doesn't look very good in this book? <laughs> I'm literally on it on that chapter right now from yeah. Paramount to Paranoia. Yeah, there's I I'm, there's, I mean, I'm not gonna you know. Say anything specific. I'm but... only on one, two. I'm only on the third page. Oh, of this you have no idea. You haven't even. Oh, th- th- I'm sure is, it's Brad Gray. It's this is brilliant stuff. This I'm is, sure it's Brad Gray. It's no, because she 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 loves Sherry Lansing. Oh, everyone loves Sherry Lansing. I mean, Sherry Lansing comes up, and, and the thing is, everyone loves Sherry Lansing legitimately for all those reasons. I I I mean, Sherry Lansing is so universally beloved because she's friends with everyone and she just loves everyone. Sherry Lansing talked to my Peter Guber class when I was in film school. And among many other people, I mean, obviously we had, you know, John Peters and David Putnam and uh, Larry Gordon and Jerry Bruckheimer and Don Simpson. I mean, they all came and talked to our class at that time. Goober was able to really, you know, pull in the cream of the crop at the time to really talk to this class. It was unbelievable. I, I look back and I'm like, holy crap, did all those people really come in and talk to our class? Are you kidding me? Uh, but they did. And Sherry was one of them. <laughs> and she said to the class, she goes, you know, I tell everybody, I'm, I'm going to tell you. And I may resent saying this to a film school class, but I return every call that I get every day. And I thought, you are an unbelievable lady. Because I would normally say, you're stupid, but I know you're not stupid. That's amazing, because I guarantee you, half the people in this class are going to call you up and go, would you, would you return my call? I want you to make my movie. Like, I mean, she's, and she's, she's going to do it. She's going to return calls that film students send to her. I just thought, that's amazing that you would say that to a film school class. I return every call I get every day. Did you call her? I, of course not. I'm not. I'm no. I'm not going to do that. I know what the. I mean, th- that doesn't mean she's going to make your movie. It just means she's going to return your call. That's true. Uh, that's all. Wait, so anyway, you know, we used to talk about DVDs on. The we show. used to, and we need to again. And speaking of the butler, um, <laughs> that includes the word "but." You know, uh, one of the one of the the part one of the people who's in the butler actually is Cuba Gooding Jr., who has not made an actual movie. And by actual movie, I mean a movie that has been released in movie theaters for I don't know how many years. I know. It, 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 he, he's like Mr. Straight to DVD. So I'm, I'm hoping that maybe there's something in the butler that will, uh, you know, that will resurrect his career. But 
That being said, uh, we've got a couple of straight to D- <laughs> DVD Cuba Gooding vehicles Poor here, guy. and I, I, you know, if it weren't for the butler, I wouldn't even be mentioning them. But um, Mark, what 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 do these two have in common? Cuba Gooding Jr. W- carrying a gun. Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> one is summoned, and uh, the other one, the title is, is absolute deception. Yes, and both of them have a picture of Cuba holding a gun on the on the cover. Well, because uh, you know why? Because it's straight to DVD, and you see the cover, and he's looking all seventied out in yeah. absolute deception. He's carrying a gun. You figure it's a thriller. It's exciting. <laughs> Lots of violence. I'm on board. But uh, this movie obviously is uh, terrible. No. Yeah, they're, no, they're, neither one of them is terribly good. And the thing good. is that, that, that there's nobody else in the And there's a the woman film. On, on the cover of both of them, too. That is true. Yeah. But there's nobody else in these films but him. I mean, yeah. it's him and a bunch of people you've never heard of. That's right. Payday. Uh, Boat payments. It's, 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 it's a payday. Uh, so anyway, do we have to explain what these are? No. I mean, in no. Absolute Deception, no. he plays an FBI agent. And uh, in Summoned, he uh, plays a, uh, a serial killer. He's, and Kuba's got to find him. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what can I say? He's, he's terrible. He's on the case. He's on the case, and it's so great how like now these straight to DVD these straight to DVD movies get to say, starring Academy Award winner Cuba Gooding Jr. You know, there's yep. a movie out uh, coming out called In a World. I know, <laughs> I, I know, want to see that. I know, starring uh, what's her Lake face? Bell, whatever. Yeah, it, she directed it. Oh, is that right? Yeah. In a world. Yeah, Ray saw it. He saw it up at Sundance. Who was it good? He didn't think much of it. Really? No. Uh, and then also should point out the Clint Eastwood 20 film collection uh, has come out on Blu-ray. Ooh. That came out uh, about a month ago. And the only they, – they didn't send it to us, of course, but they uh, – because it's, you know, too expensive to send to us. It's like 180 bucks or and, you know, 130 on, on DVD so that, that they can't send a lot of those around. Not that they're losing anything on it. That's just being cheap. But uh, damn Warner Brothers, you and your butler problems, and now you're being cheap on us. Damn you, Warner Brothers. But they did send us uh, Eastwood Directs, The Untold Story, uh, which is the uh, the documentary about his whole directing style and uh, all the people he's worked with. And I got to tell you, it's really good, but um, <laughs> there, there's, there's no untold story here. <laughs> <They're> not, <laughs> the story's been told. It's a, I mean, I always hate that. It's, that's like the worst cliche, the untold story. It's like something that appears on, a, on, a, on a, you know, a, a, an unauthorized biography by Kitty, uh, whatever her name is. Well, there's two. There's the Eastwood Factor, and then there's Eastwood Directs the Untold Story. Those are the two kind of documentary things on this big disc. It was like yeah. 100 bucks. But it's you know it's right up there. It has uh, trouble with the curve, which I thought was old fashioned and, yeah. and fun. J. Edgar not good. Hereafter not good. Invictus not good. Gran Torino was hilarious. Gran Torino is a weird movie because I don't know that Clint Eastwood expected us to think that movie was so goddamn hilarious. <laughs> I just found that movie hilarious. No, not at all. I don't think he really wanted us to just 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 bust a gut over how horribly racist this guy was. But I just couldn't stop laughing. I I yeah. Well, you know, it, it, look. It's it's a fun film, whether it's intentional or not, it doesn't matter. You know, it's a fun film, too, Space Cowboys. I think Space Cowboys is fun. I like that movie. I do. And uh, people love Perfect Oh, World. Space Cowboys. That's right. Where the, it is fun. James it, Garner. And, it's uh, like uh, all the old dudes as astronauts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Fire, oh, remember Firefox? I loved Firefox. That was, that was, was that the magic year? Was that an 82 film? Uh, Fire. It was right Fox. in there. Let me I don't see. think it was an 82 film. It might have been like no, an 81 No, it was 82. Film. It was 82. It was 82. See? That damn 82, man. It's That's awesome. the year. So, wow. the, Clint Eastwood, he sent to Russia or the Soviet Union to steal a prototype jet fighter. Yeah. That, is, awesome. uh, that can be controlled by your mind. That was the, the first big effects film that um, uh, John Dykstra did after Star Wars. Is that right? Remember, because he, he lost the gig after Star Wars. Dykstra wanted, to, wanted too much power over the next Star Wars film. So, when they did Empire Strikes Back, they brought in Brian Johnson, who had done all the stuff on Space 1999. Brian Johnson. See, that's was, how you know that story because it's related to Space Night. Of course, 1999. Brian Johnson. I'm like, how do you know that? Brian Johnson was the was the effects guy for uh, Space 1999, and he came on and did Empire Strikes Back, and John Dykstra was kind of thrown to the curve with his, uh, I think it was Adagee was his, uh, or Apogee. Apogee. No, Apogee. 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 Yeah, that was his effects company. And then he finally you know, got an, uh, another big gig with uh, Firefox. It was great. Love now, it. now, speaking of light comedies, Wade, why don't you talk about what's in your hand right we're now? Gonna, we're going to talk about documentaries first. Mark, I, 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 this is the subject of more Mark Kaiser jokes in, in history than any true. other movie. So I'm going to let you talk about it. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it, Criterion. We're talking about a Criterion documentary release, which uh, you should set some time aside for. I mean, as, as much as we're going to laugh at this. <laughs> I mean, this is as much as we're going to laugh at this. This is this is a groundbreaking, yeah, um, all time masterpiece. This is the uh, Claude Landsman's nine hour Shoah. 
Now, Shoah is from 1985, and uh, it's about the Holocaust, and he interviews survivors and people who lived through the war and experienced the war. He visits, uh, you know, a bunch of key sites uh, from the Holocaust all across uh, Poland. He visits a couple of extermination camps, testimony. I mean, Shoah is absolutely definitive. Yep. It is about as definitive a documentary as you will ever get about any subject. First of all, because it's nine freaking hours. Yes. But um, also because it is just that good. So obviously, nine hours is you know that's a that's a that's that's a good five days of movie and, watching. And, and, and we should point out at age eighty seven, he is still making documentaries. He was recently with one at the Cannes Film Festival. So, but he's never done anything that uh, sort of Showa is his you know his magnum opus, and it really is an unbelievable movie. I mean, it is it is the lab, it is a labor of love. It is a labor of passion. It's a labor of justice. And uh, Criterion just went bananas on this thing. So, as you have to, really. Uh, but it's long. Just bear in mind, it's long. You know, it, it's 566 minutes. It, it, it uh, and it definitely wears you down emotionally. At a certain point, you just kind of, you just sort of check out, and it becomes academic. It, you, you, there's just no other way to sort of react to it and respond to it. Although we gave it uh, best documentary way back in 1985. Yes, we did before we Laffy were did. even in the group. That is true. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I wish I asked Myron about that. Myron, what was it like when you voted show of the best documentary? <laughs> Did people actually watch it, or did they, did they, were they just guilted into it and just said, "I can't, I, you know what, I'm fine, sure, here it is." What, what am I going to vote against this? Let's just say, like, do I, need in, to, do I need to watch nine hours to know I'm going to vote for this? In, in your in your 1985 Oscar pool, if you didn't click this, you were out of your mind. <laughs> anyway, this is a 4K digital transfer, so yeah. obviously the footage is very old, but it still looks fantastic. Yeah, beautiful. There's three additional films by Landsman um, that are included here. There's a conversation between Landsman, and uh, that's a great interview right there. So. Again, I don't know what to say of otherwise, uh, other than if you love documentaries and you're a Holocaust scholar and any interest in the Holocaust show is a masterpiece. And we got a lot of foreign, foreign affair type stuff on the documentary front this week. Uh, the next one is uh, the 2012 Best Documentary uh, nominee, The Gatekeepers. Yeah. Which I, like think should have, I think should have won. This also won our LAFCA award. Uh, I thought it should have won the Oscar, but I understand why the, the Searching for Sugar Man won. Because it's cool. Search of Sugar Man's a cool documentary. But The Gatekeepers is unbelievable. Uh, this is essentially a documentary that uh, brings together every single living uh, former head of Shin Bet, which is the Israeli Secret Service, to talk about the current situation in Israel and you know their experiences and what they've done wrong and what they should do going forward if you had to do it again and how are we going to solve this horrible situation. And mind you, every single one of them without without f- fault without uh, exception says you know what this ain't working we got to we got to do something else that's the amazing part of it every and, single one and, 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 and these these guys are not cherry picked to to no, say what the director no. wants them to say these are f- former heads of shin bet every single former head of shin bet there are only two heads of shin bet from the beginning of the state of israel who are not interviewed here one of them is dead and the other one is the current head, who obviously, because of his his position, is not allowed to talk to do, to, to documentary crews. But every single other guy who has ever run Shin Bet from the beginning of the state of Israel is interviewed here, and without fail, they all say the same thing: it ain't working. I mean, it really it's powerful. It, wherever you lie on the political spectrum, you can't watch this and not go. Well, I guess there's another side to the coin. There isn't. It's just it's amazingly persuasive, and they don't. Um, yeah, they're not cherry picked, and it's it's just a beautiful film. Yep, it's a powerful I agree. film. It really is. Uh, this is on Blu-ray from Sony Pictures Classic, also on DVD. But we got a Blu-ray in front of us, and uh, I don't normally say, "Oh, well, you know, the documentary, you know, you got to see it on Blu-ray." But this one, you really do. There's just something, um, something that just kind of it, it just the, those faces. The faces are just seeing those faces in high def. Really, really, just makes it so personal. Uh, Way Death by China is a another documentary. This is one of those more of a DIY uh, situation here. Uh, this is all about how uh, America's, f- you know, manufacturing relationship with Why China China's is wonderful is going to be an issue yeah. uh, unless you work in the movie biz, in which case you should just do nothing but praise China for, from from here to eternity. Yep. But uh, the fact, you know, here's the thing, Wade. In a hundred years, when I'm long dead. I, I just think that China's going to like just own the world. I mean, there's a billion of them. Yeah, but you know what? That well, I mean, this a lot of these this this doc doesn't necessarily get into it so much. But a lot of people are saying the Chinese economy is going to implode. Well, I mean, there, well, there's rapid, rapid growth it's, in China. And remember, over. China doesn't 
China doesn't actually own any intellectual property. You know, this is the thing. The United States and England and France, there, there are, you know, every one of these countries has industry that people rely on. Like we've got Apple Computer and we've got Google and all this stuff. What does China make that they actually own? They don't. They make the stuff that everybody else invents. It's just, it's, you know, where we're, as we're a consumer-driven economy, China is a manufacturing-driven economy. And that could re- that, that's a bubble that can pop. It's, you know, and the problem is it's a bubble that can pop and bring everybody else down with it. That is true. And so. you'll, uh, you'll hear some of that in Death by China, which is, uh, look, it's vital. It's interesting. It's a good primer on the subject. It uh, puts people on notice. Uh, so it's good stuff. Death by China. The autobiography. We're, we're heavy, heavy stuff today. The autobiography of Nikolai Ceausescu. Uh, you know, I, as people know, who know me know, I'm not a fan of dictators. I, you know, they sort of bug me a little bit. Uh, a lot of that comes from the fact that I, uh, my mother grew up under Hitler, so I, I, I tend to view them rather negatively. And you were I literally under Hitler? Like, literally like under. Hitler was at a desk? And yeah, that's it. Under the she desk. was under the desk, precisely. <laughs> Growing up. Uh, Ceausescu, uh, I, I, I celebrated the day that he and, he and his wife got shot in the alley. I really did. Uh, this guy was just such a brutal, horrible, miserable uh, individual. What he did to Romania is just inexcusable. And uh, the autobiography of Nikolai Ceausescu is, uh, is all about this psychotic lunatic. And uh, it, it, what's interesting is it uses his own... All the stuff that he shot to generate his own myth, all of his own propaganda, it sort of uses it against him. And boy, does it beautiful. It's just so well put together. Uh, they went through uh, like a thousand hours of stuff to, uh, to come up with this movie. It is, uh, it is really, really well done. Director Andre Ujica, I hope I haven't murdered his name, uh, really, really does a great job. This is just an exceptional film, a beautiful look at history. And uh, bravo to Kino Lorber for bringing it out. Uh, Wade, uh, one of the great documentary experiments of all time. <clears throat> Continued last year with uh, Michael Apted's 56 Up. Yeah. Now, in uh, 1964, I think it was, Michael Apted, the young Michael Apted, uh, did a documentary called 7 Up. It was actually, it was 7 Up. It was, uh, he interviewed uh, seven, he interviewed a group of seven-year-olds about, uh, you know, their childhood and what they want when they grow up and what their life is like and li- living in England. And he revisited that group of kids every seven years. There's been a 7-up, a 14-up, a 21-up, 28-up, 35-up, 42-up, 49-up, and now, 2012, we have 56-up. So if you look at the totality of this series, it is unbelievably remarkable because you see what these kids wanted to be when they were 7 and 14 and 21 and how their lives actually turned out. What's he going to call the last one? Like Up Yours? Up Yours. Well, it's funny because some of these subjects, they feel like their life's been kind of ruined by this documentary series because they feel like every seven years there's going to be be a public accounting of their life. That's what's interesting. Is is this documentary really hands-off or is it a little bit like a reality show where, I mean, are you really watching lives as they would unfold? Or has the movie become part of the lives unfolding? Well, at seven-year increments, it's tough to say that I don't know that the subjects say to themselves, wow, I can't do that because it'll wind up in the documentary in five years. Because seven years is enough of, a, just, it, it, enough it, of a gap where they just probably it, just live their lives. Don't you think at some point it's going to be like, you know, go away? No, well, well, no. It's some of these, he, <laughs> I know. Look, Michael uh, uh, Apted, he had to chase these people down. I know. And some of them didn't want to talk to him. I know. So uh, I, I think he got them all. Uh, but it's just absolutely remarkable. Nothing like it. Cannot wait for, uh, uh, what's 56 plus 7? Cannot wait for 63 up. <laughs> 70. Is, is Apted going to be around for 70 up? I know. I think uh, Apted is, he's, he's, he's got to be in his 70s, right? He's in his 70s. Yeah, he was born in 1941, so how old? Yeah. Uh, well, 1941, uh, let's see, that makes so him 72. 72. 72. Wow. Yeah, 72. So in, 70, so in 79, he, when he's 79, he'll be doing 63 up. Yeah. Which, which shows how young he was when he started this project. Yeah, so how, he'll be in his 80s to do 70 up. Yeah. But, you know, he will. I, 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 Because, uh, you know, I, I didn't do it this year, uh, but I usually run a uh, 5K race on the uh, 4th of July, and he's always there. He is. He's always there. He's running, man. He's keeping himself fit. So he'll if he, he's keeping himself, you know, ready to. He's, he'll be there for seventy up. You got to. You got to go from seventy up to seventy, seven to seventy. You got to do it because it's the perfect deal, right? And because he directed a Bond film, it's the seven thing. 007. Oh yeah. Ba bam. Yeah. Super bam. I anyway, fifty six up is double, uh, 007 up. Unbelievable. Uh, a couple of uh, first run features titles here that come in the little thin eco packaging uh, stuff here. Um, 
One is called Ferlinghetti, A Rebirth of Wonder. This is a film by uh, Christopher Felver. And uh, if you, if Ferlinghetti is like this, uh, he's like a beat generation fixture. He's, you know, I, I, I've never read his poetry. Uh, all I know is what I've seen in the documentary, and I have to say, I don't particularly care for the poetry. But um, he's a he's a central figure, you know. He's right there with the uh, Burroughs and Ginsburg and Kerouac, and uh, he, 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 you know, his bookstore is very famous that he he opened in the in the 1950s. So I thought it was an interesting uh, portrait of a guy. A uh, guy I probably wouldn't have any interest in otherwise. And uh, then we've also got Eleven Flowers by Chinese director Wang Shaoshui. <laughs> Mark, say that ten times quickly. Uh, no. Yeah. Well, anyway. Uh, this is not a documentary, but I'm throwing it in there because First Run Features uh, so rarely actually uh, comes up with you know films that are – I mean, most of what they do are documentaries. So it's nice when uh, you get a First Run Feature that is, uh, is narrative. And this is really uh, quite touching. This is one of the few new Chinese films that I'm actually fond of uh, because so many of them are just so generic now. And they're either you know very kind of reactionary or they're very kind of party line. Uh, but this is a cultural revolution story about a, a young boy. And it's just his uh, how he and his family are just making it through, and you know, trying to somehow keep their hold their lives together uh, right at the end of the Cultural Revolution, and hopefully make it to the next stage. Beautiful story, very much like uh, some of the fifth uh, generation movies that I love so much by uh, you know Zhang Yimou and Chen Kaiga, the stuff that they just don't don't do anymore. It's really nice stuff. And uh, then I want to plug a couple of documentaries that some friends of mine made. Damn it, Mark. Um, I'm going to assume you'll be you'll rave. Do you know Doug Blush? Have you ever met Doug? Uh, you've mentioned him to me, but I've not met him. Doug, uh, Doug, I, I, I know Doug through Ray, and uh, Doug was very Doug and his wife uh, Lisa Klein, tremendous documentarians, really, really good people, and uh, they had all kinds of success with their documentary of Two Minds, which is now out from Docurama, which is uh, formerly a division of New Video, which of course is all a division now of Cine Dime. Uh, the new Chris McGurk Empire, Chris McGurk formerly of Overture, whose house we were at where uh, we saw Dustin Hoffman. Oh, my God. It was so embarrassing <laughs> because I love Dustin Hoffman so much. And you're like, what are you going to say to Dustin Hoffman? Oh, my God. Here comes Dustin Hoffman. And I was like, I've loved all your movies since <laughs> I was a kid. It was just something. It was just like, God, you're such an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is wrong with me? Well, anyway. and then and then get this. We were with Andrew. Remember, Boy, we, this is a tangent. We, Go on. We were with. Uh, were we with Andrew Curtis? Yes, or, we were. Or did he tell us that? No, no, we no, were, no, we're with, with Andrew. Andrew. And then Andrew, of course, Mark the idiot was like, "I love your movies. Yes, I like you." Then Andrew walks and then across Andrew the grass. Says, he's he's like, "1992, Prospero." No, it was, it was Shylock. He's Shylock on the, on the boards at the Globe. You were brilliant. <laughs> and of course, Dustin Hoffman's like, oh, thank you, sir. That's very nice of you. What is your name? Would you like a drink? Thank you very much. I'd like come home with me. Great. And can I buy you something? And, you know, and I'm like, God damn it. Why couldn't I think of something that it's cool? It's the British accent. Uh, you, you can't but he be... knew something specific. Yeah. That's like an actor thing. I and saw like, you on the stage in the uh, West End God. in 1992. And damn you were brilliant. It. Me off. Doing Shakespeare. That's why you. That's how you suck up to an actor. I Tell know. him you've seen him doing Shakespeare. I love all your movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, coming what back a bad around. That is. Uh, of two minds is uh, is really an unbelievably uh, touching and heartfelt movie about uh, bipolar disorder. And uh, it's it it you know if you, it's it's so funny because you wonder well hasn't anybody made a movie about bipolar disorder? Actually, no. Nobody has really made. A movie looking at it and looking at the people who suffer from it and how it affects their lives and their relationships and their because their... they can't focus enough to make the movie. Well, That's why. <laughs> but this is really good. I mean, they did a great job here. It's 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 sometimes uh, really hard to watch, but it's really touching and very insightful. And it'll make you a more compassionate person as a result. And then uh, the Black Kung Fu Experience by uh, Martha Burr and Mei Jun Chen. Uh, Martha Burr is uh, is a good friend of mine. She used to be an editor at Wushu Kung Fu Magazine, where I wrote uh, f- intermittently and semi regularly. And uh, Martha has done uh, Martha's done a number of these uh, martial arts documentaries, and they are all absolutely outstanding. And this is so long overdue. The Black Kung Fu Experience, which was originally uh, aired on PBS. Uh, looks at the you know everybody like Jim Kelly just died. We should point out, which is is at rather un, it's you know a tragedy that coincides in a very timely way because uh, one of the reasons that Enter the Dragon was such a huge hit 
in the urban community in the United States, not just because Bruce Lee was really, really big in the urban community, but because Jim Kelly was also big. And he was in that movie, you know, with the kung fu and the fro and the whole thing. And nobody has ever really, really gotten to the meat of where this thing happened. Like, kung fu movies exploded in the U.S., but they exploded first in the black community. Like, what, what, what is it with kung fu and black people? This is, this, that's what this gets into. And it looks uh, more specifically at a group of, uh, of, of uh, pioneering black martial artists. Uh, Ron Van Cleef, Dennis Brown, Tayari Casal, and Don Hamby. I'd never heard of these guys, but man, uh, it totally makes sense. All of a sudden, you understand how these two different cultural experiences coincide and why they coincide at a particular point in time. And uh, it's a great documentary. So Martha and her, uh, her co-director, Major and Chen, did a great job. So bravo to them. Awesome. Love it. Uh, speaking of awesome, love it, Wade, we have a terrific documentary called Brooklyn Castle. Brooklyn Castle is a... Uh is a doc that takes place at a uh, school in uh, Brooklyn where uh, over half the kids live below the federal poverty line, but they have the highest-ranked junior high chess team in the nation. And the documentary charts these kids who are great at chess, and they're all quite poor, and it's a great documentary. It's lively, and it's fun, and you just love these kids, and it's all about these kids. They're... You know, they have such horrible home lives, but yet they're smart enough to just be these amazing chess players, and uh, it's great. It's emotional, and it's powerful, and it's positive, and Brooklyn Castle is, uh, is a really cool doc, and you will love it. Um, it's a great story. Brooklyn Castle, highly recommended. Beautiful. And then I got a trio here as we wind down the, uh, the doc segment. Got a trio here from the uh, Cinema Libre people, which are, uh, you, you know, their stuff is all very politically active, left uh, of center to progressive. And uh, these are three from their Earth Now series. Um, one of them is the first 70, which is uh, about the, uh, the threats to California's state parks. I actually live near a number of state parks. I've got to say they're not terribly well maintained. So there is, there is something to this. You know, the, uh, the California state park system is, is in problem. And then uh, this is the other one is called Save the Farm, which is about uh, the – and this is interesting. There are actually a number of uh, celebrities who show up in this, you know, including Amy Smart and Daryl Hannah, who's always active at something. And this is all a, uh, an urban farm in the middle of uh, South Central L.A., which, of course, we're supposed to call South L.A. now. You know that, right? I, it's been doing, they've been doing that for years. Yeah. It's like, wow, suddenly it just became safer because they changed the name. But it's, 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 it's interesting. You don't realize that these little kind of, uh, you know – these these community farms, these little urban farms, are sometimes the only pieces of green in these giant concrete and asphalt landscapes. So that's a very, that's an important story. That one, you know, uh, I remember some of this stuff when you know. In fact, I'm not even sure it was this one. I remember there was there was one. I think it's Santa Monica that there was a big dust up over. Anyway, this is a good story. And then uh, the last one is Scavenger Hunt, which is uh, all about the California condor. And uh, I, I found this so informative, and it, it, it increased my appreciation of the condor even more because I've actually seen a condor. Did you know that? Uh, I saw three days of the condor. I actually, I've seen a condor once. It strafed our house, and um, my wife like, all, thought it was a plane at first. It was so huge. We see hawks all the time, okay? They're big, right? Condor is like enormous. It's like a Boeing seven forty seven compared to a Cessna. It's freaking enormous. You, you just it, you're not accustomed to seeing it. And it was the one time strafe the house, and you just go, "That is the biggest thing I have ever seen in the sky. It is huge and so impressive." So, bravo to the California Condor. Keep it uh, big. Oh, uh, wait, uh, bravo to Allen Ginsberg. And uh, Allen Ginsberg, if you don't know, he was a uh, beat poet and a major literary figure of the time. And the time we're talking about, like the, you know, yeah, sixties or whatever, yeah, fifties uh, and sixties. Um, the life and times of Allen Ginsberg is a terrific uh, sort of a two disc primer on his life. It includes interviews with a bunch of people who were there at the time, including John Baez and William Burroughs and Timothy Leary. But it also includes uh, new interviews with stars. You're like, really? They cared about Allen Ginsberg? Oh yes, Johnny Depp interviewed <laughs> here. Cares about Alan Ginsburg. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny Depp? Isn't he the star of some movie that's tanking like miserably right I now? I know. You know what? It's just mm-hmm. the thing is the thing with Lone Ranger is that like it can't really decide what it wants to be. It's like is it a ti- is it is it an art is it a does he want to make a typical western an atypical western an action comedy a mystical thing? Mm-hmm. So it just winds up being everything. Not to detour too much from Alan Ginsburg, but I want to tell you they missed their opportunity because they had a chance 
to reboot the Lone Ranger in a very, very relevant way compared to like with the housing crisis and the economic crisis. People can't get loans. If he were the Lone Ranger. I knew there was something stupid coming. I could tell. You see, I, you, you'd be a bad poker player because I knew something bad was about to happen. <laughs> And, and by the, the way, L O A N Ranger. In, 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 in this film, there's no Clinton Spillsbury th- to speak of. Clinton Spillsbury. F- Clinton yes. Spillsbury. I, I know. Who is the star of the last Lone Ranger film? I know. I know. The and one from 19, what was it? 81. 81, yeah. And it was the only film. Boy, that he, he ever, ever made. did. The only film he ever made <laughs> it's was a, The Lone Ranger. It's a tainted uh, franchise. It really is. At this point. Well, no, I mean, if, if, if you spend a quarter of a billion dollars and can't make it work, who's going to. Who's going to jump on that bandwagon? Uh, you, know, the, you know, the Lone Ranger was created by the same guy who created the Green Hornet. You know that, right? Right. The, in fact, the Green Hornet, the character of the Green Hornet, is supposed to be like the grandson of the Lone Ranger. There's a, there's a connection between the two stories there. You know, did you know that? No, that I didn't know. Yeah. It's like, it's like the, the, the Lone Ranger's grandson or great-grandson is the Green Hornet. That's, that's the whole thing. Wow. And given how well audiences embraced uh, the Green Hornet two years ago, what were they thinking? Well, no one really knows that. But yeah, but it's, you know it's, what? Just, it's, 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 I think, too, that the Lone Ranger is almost, as a character, to be played properly, he's really too old-fashioned for this yes. world. He's just like the straight-arrow guy who well, just wants he's to do a right. Different, he's a different generation of superhero. And that, and that uh, kind of describes Alan Ginsberg, too, doesn't it? It really is. A, he, he, Alan Ginsberg is a new generation of superhero. Anyway, good stuff. 120 hours of footage was shot by uh, director Jeffrey Aronson and uh, Jerry Aronson, and he did a great job putting it together. Uh, this is a great. St- this is great stuff. If you want to know what what it was like in those days and how heady and and uh, unique those days were, then check out the life and times of Alan Ginsberg. Uh, new movies, and the uh, this shows you what a slow week <laughs> that this is. Um, the new movie this week is Admission. This is it. This is it, Mark. This is we got we, the one that you're holding there and admission. These are the two uh, big new releases this week. So we're we're kind of in a phase now where the January and February movies are getting released and some March movies, and uh, it's not a lot of great stuff. You know, admission I, I thought got kind of unfairly hammered. I think Tina Fey and Paul Rudd are wonderful. I love them both. I think their chemistry is wonderful. There's just nothing remarkable about the story. So it's kind of like they're, you know, you admire their strokes, but they're still swimming upstream. Uh, That's beautiful way you admire. Right? Is, uh, what a turn of phrase. Yeah. So anyway. beautiful. I, I don't. I don't know how people just come up with some of these stories. I really don't. Anyway, uh, you know, Tina Fey plays a, a Princeton admissions officer, and uh, Paul Rudd plays a former classmate that she bumps into, and you know. I guess we're supposed to just suddenly uh, really tune into all their their wonderful romantic travails. Um, uh, Paul White's, oh, fine, you know, decent job directing this, but it's just not great material, you know. It's just uh, again swimming upstream. Uh, so there it is. It's on. It's it, you know, you get this. Uh, you can do your little ultraviolet thing on this. It's got. I got here a Blu-ray DVD ultraviolet digital copy combo mondo thing from Focus Features, which of course is a division of Universal, so it's all ultraviolet. Uh, Wade, uh, Stephanie Meyer is the writer of the original Twilight series. You know what that means? That means when you have a hit, that means every other book you've ever written or will write is will be automatically made into a movie. Yeah, until they all flop. Until they all flop. And that, that, uh, that string of flops uh, has begun. Wow. The Host from uh, last year. This, is, uh, this stars uh, Shorsh 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 Ronan. I love her. She's awesome. Yeah, she is totally. Shorsh Ronan, she's awesome. Yep. Uh, Dan Kruger, uh, Jacob Bell, who's like the latest uh, it guy. She, she's in Byzantium too. Have you seen that? The, I have the, not. the Neil Jordan film Byzantium. Is it good? I, you know, everybody's ripping on it, man. Alonzo just tore it to shreds. I liked it. Really? I mean, yes, it's 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 not your it's not your typical vampire movie. It's more of a kind of an in, an existential and kind of art house vampire movie. But so what? You know, I, I dug it. I thought it was cool. Uh, Max Irons, the son of Jeremy Irons, is in it as well as William Hurt. Anyway, this movie uh, just did not really. Uh, take oh, Max off Irons, all. he's Max hot. Irons. He's he's nicknamed Hot Irons. Here, talk talk, talk about something. Else. Okay, all right, Here, never mind. I'm gonna hand this Sorry. to you because if you're talking, it means you're not making jokes. <laughs> Totally, that's true. Um, you know, I, uh, I I like Rupert Grint. I respect uh, anyone who's trying to shed the Harry Potter thing. And uh, I don't even know if this... I'm a little bit out of it, Mark, because if I'm not on the radio on a given week, I'm not worried about what gets theatrically released. Did Into the White actually make it into theaters? 
Oh God, I, I I had never even heard of it till the uh, Blu-ray crossed our desks. Okay, well, this is from desks. Magnolia. I got the Blu-ray right in my hand, and uh, you have what in your hand? The Blu-ray. Oh, stop it, you cad. Why I oughta? Uh, no, this is this is actually a pretty cool film. It's uh, it's about a, you know it's a survival movie basically about. Uh, I, I guess it's a little bit like. Um, What's the uh, what's the John Borman movie? Uh, uh, not Hope Floats, Hope. Uh, no, 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 Hope and Glory. No, no, no. The John Borman movie uh, the, with the Deliverance. island, the, the American and the Japanese uh, on the uh, with the, the you know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, Star Wars. The, the original film that was remade as uh, Enemy Mine by. Uh, oh yeah, it's a uh, Hang On Please Hold. No, I'm gonna think of it. I'm gonna think of it. Keep talking. It's yeah, keep talking. Anyway, that's kind of what this is. Uh, it is. It's apparently a true story, uh, about a couple of fighter pilots, one German and. Um, one British, and uh, they have to kind of, uh, you know, survive together in this cabin uh, somewhere in this desolate part of Norway after they after they crash. And uh, it's uh, it's a really interesting story. I mean, it doesn't overly kind of preach the uh, you know you were enemies now you have to be brothers angle. It doesn't really ram that down your throat. It just kind of lets the actors do their thing. I don't. If this didn't get a theatrical release, it really should have because it's. Um, it's good. It's it's well done all the way through by Peter Ness, the or Petter Ness, who uh, I, I'm going to assume is a Norwegian director, and uh, it's really good. It's got Rupert Grint and Stig Henrik Hoff, David Cross, Florian Lucas, and Lachlan Niebuhr. So as you can tell by the fact that I have just destroyed the names of the rest of the cast, the only person here of note is Rupert Grint. And I guess his success in Harry Potter was not enough to convince people that he has any marquee value outside of Harry Potter. So anyway, um, good film, Into the White. Definitely check it out. I love World War II movies, and this is a good one. Uh, Wade, um, mixed uh, feelings about the brass teapot. This is... uh the star is Juno Temple, who I like a lot. I like Juno Temple she's a lot. She's good. She's, I'm just I, waiting for I, her to explode. She's going to win an Oscar. She's going to be like, you know, at some point she will. She's not going to be the next Jennifer Lawrence, but she's going to pop like Jennifer Lawrence. She'll get that part. Yeah, There'll be a part, and she'll just be like the, the next hot thing, and everybody, she'll be on every magazine cover, and it'll be, oh, Juno, Juno. That moment will come. It hasn't come yet, but it will. But she has to stop doing these marginal films that uh, are okay, but not great, and don't get much attention. Anyway, yeah. Magnolia also brings us the brass teapot. This is the uh, magical story about uh, two crazy young kids who... Uh, crazy to, kids. Crazy kids who go to an antique store and they find a magical teapot that oh. like spouts money every time somebody's in pain. Really? Any, any, when, That's whenever, the story? When, whenever they're near somebody feeling physical pain, it spouts money. Really? Yes. Okay. That is a movie. Okay. And of course, it's uh, it's a bit uh, you know uh, allegorical, and uh, it's okay. You know, again, the the two stars, it's uh, Juno and Michael and Garano. Who I don't know who that is. It reminds me a like little. Him. That reminds me a little bit of that, uh, that 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 William Shatner Twilight Zone. Oh, where, the, the, uh, where they go the, into the diner. Yeah, and, the, and then Shatner. It's a little, it's, no, it's a, it's the thing that gives them the, the, the little, little fortune little deals. Fortunes, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Anyway, <laughs> the, uh, the 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 look the uh, the two leads are pretty appealing, and uh, I do love Juno Temple. Um, it's just it's just a bit of a minor you know for those who curiosity for those who don't live in uh, in the United States the the or even in Los Angeles I, I'm assuming that maybe Los Angeles is the only place this happens but the um, the Twilight Zone marathon on Fourth of July best thing ever no no th- I, I think that's on Sci Fi Network is it Sci Fi Network yeah. I don't remember all I know is I turn the television on the Fourth of July flip around I always find a Twilight Zone episode all day long. Uh, Boy is a really, really good uh, New Zealand film. And I have a little bit of a connection to this. Uh, This is from uh, Taika Waititi, who uh, is an Academy Award uh, nominee for a short film from a number of years ago. And his uh, his awesome short film, Two Cars, One Night, is also included on here. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I was on the shorts jury at AFI Fest many moons ago, we gave the winning award to Two Cars, One Night. Uh, right before he got an Oscar nomination uh, and Taika Waititi was there this guy is an unbelievable director he's so talented it's such a sweet short film and this is a really short I mean he's good with kids he's really good with kids this movie uh, Boy takes place in uh, 1984 and it's about this 11 year old kid and uh, his just un- this unbelievable uh, adventure that he goes on in, uh, in the summer of 1984 and uh, it's a wonderful coming of age film it's not at all what you would expect it's got this just really cool um, New Zealand sensibility to it and uh, Taika is, really should be a much bigger director than he is I, I, I hope this is the beginning of really big things for him the interesting thing about that year when we uh, were giving awards to the shorts the uh, 
there was another short that we did not give the award to, even though it was really good, uh, by a young guy named Jason Reitman. Never heard of him. Yeah. So I'm proud of all these people. But anyway, Boy is from Kino, Kino Lorber. It's on DVD and Blu-ray. Definitely check it out on Blu-ray. It's really nicely shot. Taika Waititi, uh, just a terrific filmmaker, and uh, big things will happen. So you watch this movie, you're discovering a guy who is going to be a big deal very soon. Um, Wade, um, the director of The Power of Few, has obviously seen uh, Pulp Fiction because uh, this movie is just like Pulp Fiction. It's, uh, it's got a decent cast, including Christopher Walken yep. and Christian Slater and Anthony Anderson. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's one of those movies where there's like it's set in New Orleans and there's five sets of characters and five stories and they're all taking place kind of at the same time. And then, and then sets of characters will be in the foreground for one story, recede to the background and kind of walk through the frame and maybe show up in a, for a line of dialogue or two as one of the other stories comes to the foreground. And Pulp Fiction did that so brilliantly. This one, not so much, although it is a decent... Um, take on it uh, I have to say that if you were like bored out of your mind and you whip up Netflix and you're like you know what what's the power of few I think I'll kill two hours watching the power of few I think you could do a lot worse but um, sure you could. I think you're better off in terms of buying the blu-ray no way it's a total Netflix time killer but uh, it's not bad the power of few wait I, I, I have a question for you yes hit me uh, not literally just hit me uh, with the question but what if I wanted to hit you well we'll take it out back <laughs> exactly Okay, there's a movie, Wade. Yes. Called uh, Would You Rather. Oh, dear. So it's based on those questions like Would You Rather. Would You Rather. A or B. You ready? Yeah. Would you rather be Cinderella or be Ariel? Jeez, I don't know. I, Cinderella had better dresses. Um, I'm going to say Cinderella. Better uh, style. Th- there's, no, there's no, you know... That's right, like wrong a, answer to that. Ariel from The Little Mermaid, right? How about this? Would you rather have a lightsaber from Star Wars or a phaser from Star Trek? Oh, phaser, please. Give me a break. <laughs> Freaking lightsaber. What do you do with that damn thing? It's got no range. Now, <laughs> here's a funny one. Okay. Yeah. Would you rather only be able to laugh at violently racist jokes <laughs> or only be able to laugh at intricate Star Trek jokes? That's not much of a question. That's, a, that's the strangest question I've ever no, heard. No, some of these. It, it, there, there's a, I'm, I'm not plugging the website because I just I just happen to know it exists. There's a website called called yourather.com. Yeah, and they give you these would you rather questions. Like here's one: Would you rather? <laughs> wow. Would you rather eat a chocolate covered turd or eat a turd? What? Eat, <laughs> what? I'll, I'll give you another one. What? What is this? Okay, would you rather eat Chinese food all the time or only Mexican food all the time? Isn't there a movie to talk about? No. This is is better. (laughs) Oh, here's one. Would Mm. you rather be anorexic or obese? Go. Oh, my gosh. That's horrible. Would you rather be anorexic or obese? Obese because I could work it off. Anorexic is like a a psychological disorder. (laughs) Good grief. No. (sighs) Obese, you're just lazy. You're just a fat ass. <laughs> Anorexic, you got to go to therapy. Hell no. No, no. Obese. Anytime. Because I, I like running. It'll come off. Okay. <laughs> you, you have a daughter, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Good night, it. folks. This We're done. This is the greatest done. website ever. <laughs> Would you rather regurgitate food to feed your daughter or lick your daughter to bathe her? I'd lick her anyway. <laughs> so uh, the latter. Good grief. <laughs> Who right, comes this, up with this? <laughs> this great. Dreadful. Uh, anyway, never mind. There's a movie called Would You Rather, yes. and Mark just completely took the steam out of the movie. It's mind. with uh, Brittany Snow, and, uh, you know, it's one of those movies. The movie posits, like, if you were offered a million dollars to solve all your problems, would you take the money, and what would happen? Once you, you know, it, it's a bit like Indecent Proposal, except with money instead of sex. I see. And uh, I'm just going to have to pass on it. It's just All not right. that great. Although it does star Sasha Gray, who I thought was terrific in um, Soderbergh's The Girlfriend Experience. Nice. Otherwise, um, I just She's think porn, right? The, She's a porn actress. She is a porn yeah, actress. Yeah, there you go. Okay, wait, I, I have one more for you. Yeah, hit me. Would you, would you rather eat all your meals where the food is freezing cold... Or eat all your meals with five tablespoons of salt poured on it. Oh, I'm freezing cold, dude. <laughs> That's the horrible thing. Uh, one more new movie before we get into uh, some, some classics and some library titles. American Mary, starring a wonderful actress named Catherine Isabel, is by the Soska Sisters. Now, I don't know who the Soska Sisters are, but all I know is this is uh, one of the few new horror films that I actually think is really cool. It's won a bunch of awards at, the, uh, at Scream Fest. 
And uh, Catherine Isabel is great. I think she's uh, definitely going to emerge from genre uh, anonymity into mainstream notoriety with this. Um, She basically plays a med school student who gets into underground surgery and body modification. And uh, this is a little bit like the... um, like the stuff that Nip Tuck didn't dare show you on television because they couldn't. Uh, honestly, I think this is really cool. It's got a, it's got style, it's got sensibility, it's got tongue in cheek, and it's you know what? It's actually genuinely scary. So you want to definitely check this out. American Mary, uh, a big hit at Scream Fest from the Soska sisters, who I think they're probably going to do some more stuff too. Oh wait, we have two uh, DVDs and uh, uh, associated Blu-rays of two. Pre-code Betty Davis classics, ladies and gentlemen. Ooh, One yeah. is uh, Hell's House, and this had a great 35 millimeter restoration from the good folks at Kino. <laughs> this is uh, Betty Davis. This is sort of before she was super famous because it is 1932, and uh, it's you know what? It's kind of like a um, kind of like a reform school kind of a story. Like the Hell House is a reform school. Um, I'm about to cough now, Wade. Go ahead, cough. <laughs> Do it. All Thank right. You. Yeah. I'm done now. So this is kind of fun, and I really, I really do like pre-code movies. This is on Blu-ray and DVD. You certainly don't need the Blu-ray, but uh, if you're a Blu-ray collector, go for that. Also, of Human Bondage uh, is a uh, based on the Somerset Maugham novel, and this is from 1934. And this is really one of, I think this is one of Betty Davis's first breakout performances. Um, it's with Leslie Howard, who started with Gone with the Wind, and uh, it's great stuff. Of Human Bondage is a classic because it's based on Somerset Maugham's uh, novel, and Hell's House is a little bit kitschier because it's about reform schools, but it's still kind of fun. Both on nice. Blu-ray or DVD. Nice. Sweet. DVD. I uh, got some titles from uh, Twilight Time here. We love the people at Twilight Time. They, uh, they always scour up some really interesting old titles. Remember, the Twilight Time stuff you can only find at Screen Archives. Uh, Dot com screen archives plural dot com uh, three thousand units and then they're gone they're done and uh, so you want to scrounge these up as soon as you possibly can uh, hard times was a film that Pauline Kael went nuts for which is saying something because she didn't go nuts for an awful lot but uh, this is an early Walter Hill film from nineteen seventy five and uh, the year before Rocky you've got uh, Charles Bronson as a depression era street fighter in a really really cool touching film co-written and directed by Walter Hill as I said and uh, with uh, action sequences believe it or not edited by Roger Spottiswood see another former Bond Uh, uh, director yeah isn't that great and some great supporting performances here Uh, Struther Martin who everybody always forgets about is just just, he's he's a drug addicted cut man in this movie he's great Uh, James Coburn is the uh, the really sleazy promoter it's just uh, it's got a really great style it's one of those good solid 70s movies that uh, everybody always forgets about and uh, Twilight Time has snatched that up from the uh, Columbia Library you gotta go to screenarchives.com to find it and then the only game in town, uh, which uh, is, is, and believe also these, uh, worth pointing out, these all have isolated soundtracks. Uh, that's part of the Screen Archives thing. So the isolated score uh, available on all these Twilight Time titles. Uh, this one's from the 20th Library, the only game in town. Uh, which is kind of sad because it reminds me what Warren Beatty used to look like. And every time I see Warren Beatty uh, as a young man, as like a strapping young stud, I just go, oh, man, he's like old and jowly now. It happens to all of us. It's so depressing. Anyway, Warren Beatty is in this with Elizabeth Taylor, who frankly is, is a lot worse for the wearer than Warren Beatty these days. And because uh, she's dead, you see. Mark. I don't get it. Okay. Anyway, this is the last film directed by George Stevens, believe it or not. I had uh, I'd forgotten that George Stevens kept his career going right up to 1970, just so that he could say he, he actually made a movie in the 70s, even though the 1970s is technically part of the previous decade. But you know how that's how we do it. We start with zero. Uh, the last film by George Stevens, great score by Maurice Jarre, I should point out. So the isolated score here is just wonderful. This is a tremendous Maurice Jarre score. Uh, is it a great uh, George Stevens movie? No, it's like George Stevens, like a lot of other directors at the time, is kind of trying to remain relevant and uh, what he's doing here is basically um, uh, adapting a um, a play that uh, I it still feels like a play and um, you know Beatty and Elizabeth Taylor they're good but they're still basically in a play and it's kind of a sort of a, a small movie but I don't know. I guess. It, I guess it. You know. It look. Warren Beatty and Elizabeth Taylor. You can't totally dismiss it. And again, the best thing about this is the score. Marie's Jar score. So both of these on uh, quite good Blu-rays. A way to have three uh, cult cult movies now that yeah. need to be purchased, or uh, or I will reach through the um, I will reach through the internet 
I, I GN lines. <laughs> What's it called? Uh, the, IGN.com is the website no, that we're part uh, of. Like, if you want to reach through the computer lines, it's the through the through like the the, the, the Ethernets. Yes, sure. Okay. Why not? Boy, did I blow that one. Um, saving the best for first. We have the producers, which it's just such a shame that the producers needs to be put out by Shot Factory. We love Shot Factory. We support all their stuff. Love Shot Factory. But the thing is that the producers is one of the funniest films ever made. It is an all-time classic. It has been out. It has been out many times on uh, DVD, and this is actually its uh, first time on Blu-ray, which is a bit of a shame. And it just it really is sad that. Who, I don't know if it's Warner Brothers who owns this or MGM, whoever owns this, uh, the rights of this thing. Did they really not see any value in, I don't in, know. in coming out with the producers on Blu-ray? Are you know. kidding me? I don't know. I mean, luckily, it's got to go to somebody. I'm glad it went to Shot Factory because uh, there's a great documentary here called The Making of the Producers. It's like over an hour. Um, there's a deleted scene. There's a uh, another featurette. It's a little shorter. It's still fine. Called uh, Mel and his movies. Mel Brooks and his movies. But it's the producers, and this thing is an absolute unbelievable uh, blast. Gene Wilder, who just turned eighty recently, uh, stars in it along with Zero Mostel, and of course Dick Sean. Wade loves Dick Sean. I do love Dick Sean. So the producers can't which get enough the, Dick Sean. Which by the way, you're, you're, you're not giving. He me? plays Laurent Saint Dubois. LSD baby. I think I'll put this over here. Nope. Nope. I'm going to watch this tonight. I'm going to watch this tonight. No, you're not. <laughs> you're never going to watch it. You say that, you know, you, you're know, you never going to watch it. Ow, I fell on my keys. <laughs> I'm hysterical. I'm wet and I'm hysterical. <laughs> I'm in pain and I'm wet. Oh, it's just he so, was the best. So I love Gene Wilder. God, he was the best. <sighs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> okay. So good. The other uh, cult uh, film from 1965 is The Beatles' Help. Now, Richard Lester had directed uh, the first Beatles film, A Hard Day's Night, and it was kind of a bit of a low-budget affair, but it did very well, so he was given more money to do help, and you can tell because it's in color, and they shot at a bunch of exotic locations. And um, I don't know, help is not as good as A Hard Day's Night. Uh, I think uh, A Hard Day's Night was more controlled lunacy, whereas this one just feels kind of all over the place. But um, I do like this film. They supposedly uh, based it on the Mark, Marx Brothers' Duck Soup. That was kind of an inspiration for it. Um, but, you know, the Beatles weren't really necessarily fans of this movie. I think that they spent most of this movie smoking marijuana all the time because that's what they did in the mid-60s. They, like, smoked pot for breakfast. Um, but still, a lot of great songs. Help, You're Gonna Lose That Girl, Ticket to Ride. Um, I, 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 I think it's cool. I really do like Help. This is a terrific film. If you're a Beatles completist, you cannot avoid purchasing the Blu-ray of Help. Awesome. I'll put this here. Now, the other movie that I'm going to put right here <laughs> is one of the funniest movies in the history of everything. Now, you, we all love the spoof movies, the Wayne's Brothers spoof movies and Date Night and Scary Movie, and we all love Airplane and all that kind of stuff. But before all of that, the one that started it all was from 1977, John Landis's Kentucky Fried movie. Oh, totally. This thing Zazz. is... This was Landis and Zaz. It was written Everybody by... Everybody always forgets they work together. It was written by, it was written by uh, the Zucker Brothers and, and, and uh, James Abraham, as he's, uh, as he's credited here. And uh, it was directed by John Landis. And this is just a hilarious segment. It's a, it, it, a movie. It's an anthology thing. It's got like, you know, a couple, like maybe 12 or so different uh, little tiny mini mini vignettes in it and they're all really funny a lot of them are from stars from back in the day like Bill Bixby who played the Incredible Hulk on TV Donald Sutherland the father of Kiefer Sutherland uh, George Lazenby who played uh, James Bond in one film and the great Henry Gibson and actually there's 22 um, segments and I just love this movie Kentucky Fried movie when it came out we had never seen anything like it and uh, it's great it led to the na uh, Naked Gun it led to Airplane of course John Landis went on to do Animal House and Blues Brothers and I'm going to put this right here you know, I'm putting this right here, Wade. Yeah, we'll talk. Um, Blood right and there. Sand. Right I'm, there, Wade. I'm going to do a thing. I'm going to do a thing. Movie. I'm going to do a thing for you. You ready for yeah. this? You yeah. ready for this? This is what. This is a thing that you're, you're going to hate. Yes. Okay. George Stevens. We just talked about George Stevens' last film, yes. right? Okay. Yes. Well, George Stevens uh, also directed The Sun Also Rises, right? And in The Sun Also Rises, uh, which which starred Robert Evans as a a bullfighter, right? Robert Evans, the Robert Evans, who would yes. eventually going to produce The Godfather. Very handsome in his, in his, right. in his youth. Well, Robert as it Evans. happens, that movie also starred Tyrone Power, and Tyrone Power played a bullfighter in the movie Blood and Sand. What? Do you That's like how I just made that talk. connection? Do you like wow. how I just... Wow. I, I did a little thing. Holy Christ. I did a little thing. I moved somehow from uh, Warren Beatty and Elizabeth Taylor to uh, 
Tyrone Power and Blood and Sand. Just, just with connections, just concept connections, just stream of consciousness. That's how I do. Uh, this is uh, a 20th Century Fox film from the golden era and uh, Tyrone Power and Rita Hayworth uh, as uh, you've never seen them before actually as you've seen them in just about everything else I've ever done uh, Blood and Sand with, also with, also with uh, Anthony Quinn um, you know perfectly decent uh, Hollywood golden era film from Ruben Mamoulian otherwise famous as the guy who directed the very first ever uh, Technicolor film Becky Sharp and uh, it's it, but it's a melodrama nothing uh, you know unusual about it uh, it's you know basically a just straight up guy it's a little bit like Wuthering Heights I guess uh, with bullfighting instead of um, Wuthering I don't know anyway uh, he wants to become the greatest matador in Spain and uh, bring his woman with him anyway uh, it's you know it's one of those typical Hollywood melodramas that they made back in the day and uh, I know you hate it when I say back in the day but I'm going to keep saying it and uh, the best thing about this actually is the commentary by um uh, Richard Crudo, who uh, was the director of photography and was previously uh, president of the uh, American Cinemat- uh, Society of Cinematographers. So, I again, I, I always enjoy these movies. Tyrone Power was a student of my father's, so I always kind of had a little uh, connection to these things. But, you know, it's, it's kind of standard issue melodrama with a couple of really fetching stars. And by the way, Rita Hayworth, also a student of my father's. So, there we go. I feel, I feel suddenly like it's family. Speaking of we go... Oh, are we getting to the end of the show? Yes. Hold on, where are we? Oh my goodness, we're we're over time. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna give. Uh, I'm gonna mention one last uh, old classic film, and then we'll be done with it. Mark Cohen and Tate. Do you remember Cohen and Tate? Uh, I do not. You don't? Nope. Is, really? You have nope. no recollection of Cohen and Tate? Nope. This is a 1989 movie starring um, Roy Scheider and Adam Baldwin. Adam Baldwin, like kind of coming right off of uh, My Bodyguard, but before he was, you know. Uh, and actually, what, what, Full Metal Jacket. He had just done Full Metal Jacket, I guess, uh, as well, briefly. So anyway, um, Adam Baldwin, guy who never really got a great uh, great run at this. But this was written and directed by a guy named Eric Red, who, to my knowledge, never really had much of a career after this at all. But uh, this is what they did was they took the ransom at Red Chief, the uh, O. Henry short story, and uh, turned it into kind of a, a big cop film. And it ain't bad. I uh, I don't know why this kind of vanished off the off the map, but Shop Factory has brought it back. It's on Blu-ray, and uh, among other things, it features a commentary with Eric Red and uh, interviews and deleted scenes. And uh, I actually think it's uh, I think it's pretty sharp. Anything with Roy Scheider from this period, I always like. Roy Scheider just makes everything better. So um, yeah, kind of you know, Ransom of Red Chief uh, imposed into a kind of a mob story from the late '80s. Kind of a, a cool lost little movie. Wow. I like it. All right. And, Mark, we're still looking for, uh, for sign-outs. So, you know, email we us. Some, at, though. We, we've had some suggestions, some interesting ones, some, some good ones. Uh, looking for more. So send us your suggestions for how we should sign out and sign off the show at godsatdigigods.com. Send us uh, listener mail. Send us uh, Vox boxes. We're, we're, we got, I think, maybe one Vox box uh, left from that we banked a few weeks ago, and we're going to uh, get rid of that on the next show, I think. i got to check, make sure we still got that. And then... Um, you know, here we go. Uh, signing off. See you next time.